You could start a blog today, a podcast today. A lot of people might say that's saturated, but as long as you have some sort of angle and a good value proposition, you can make anything work, right? I'm sure people like 100 years ago were saying, oh, everything in business is so saturated. You know, I think that's a cop out. Hey there, I'm Goli Kalkaran, and this is Lessons from a Quitter, where we believe that it's never too late to start over. No matter how much time or money you've spent getting to where you are, if ultimately you are not happy, then it's time to get out. If you're feeling stuck and you feel like there's got to be more, there's got to be a way to feel fulfilled and excited about what you do, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I will sit down with an inspiring guest who quit their professional career in order to forge their own path and create a life that they love. Hi, guys. Welcome back. Thank you for joining me. I am so honored to have you here, and I'm really excited. Today's episode is so inspiring and so good. We will jump in in one second. But before we do, I wanted to remind you that if you haven't already grabbed your free PDF, I created a resource called Five Steps to Finding Your Calling because I get emails weekly asking how you can figure out what you should be doing if you want to quit your job. And I was in that same position and I, you know, I read all the books, I made all the lists, I took all the quizzes to kind of figure out who I really was and what I wanted to do with my life. And I will say it's a journey. It doesn't happen, you know, overnight, but I've distilled the things that I did that really impacted me and really helped open my eyes to what I truly value and what I wanted my life to look like into a couple of actionable steps that you can take to kind of help you on your way. So if you're interested in that, make sure you grab that at quitterclub.com slash PDF. It's free. And let me know what you think of it. Let me know if you do it and you come up with some cool results. I would love to hear about it. And with that, let's jump into this incredible episode with Steve Chu from the popular blog, mywifequitherjob.com. Steve's story is so unique and inspiring. Unlike a lot of our guests, Steve actually loved his day job. He worked as an electrical engineer, but his wife didn't like her job, and she wanted to quit once she got pregnant in 2007. And so they had to come up with a way to replace her income because they live in the Bay Area and it's expensive. So in 2007, when she got pregnant, they decided to open up an e-commerce store called Bumblebee Linens. Now, we'll talk about how they came up with this idea, but he had no background in this. And they ended up creating this online store and replacing her income in those nine months, making over six figures and making this a success, you know, and allowing her to stay at home. From that, he has gone on to create a very profitable and popular blog called My Wife Quit Her Job, where he teaches others how to sell online. He also has a podcast where he goes into the kind of the same teachings, marketing tactics, um, all the things that he's learning on his journey. He also now has a live conference. He sells a course where he teaches people about e-commerce. And he has multiple seven-figure businesses that have come out of this experience. What is the most interesting to me about his journey is that he kept his day job as an electrical engineer because he loved it up until a couple of years ago. So he had multiple six-figure, seven-figure businesses that he was running on the side. And I think this brings up a subject that needs to be addressed because a lot of us, myself included, love to harp on how busy we are. And we make these excuses that we can't do things because we're so busy. And I'm not saying that we don't all have a lot going on. And some people more than others. But the reality of it is we also waste a lot of time with, you know, binge watching Netflix or scrolling on Instagram or whatever else we do to decompress. And if you're really serious about doing something on the side, which is a smart way of doing it, I think what Steve's story is a testament to is that you can do these things on the side. It is doable. And we'll get into all of the good details about how he did it. So without further ado... Let's talk to Steve. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am happy to be here. I am so happy to have you, and I can't wait to get into all of the exciting stuff that you guys are doing. My wife quit her job dot com, but we usually start kind of back in the beginning. So, why don't you give us a little bit of an understanding of what was going on in two thousand and seven before you guys started to jump into this like online e commerce world? 
Yeah. So my wife had just gotten pregnant with our first child. You know, we had been trying for a long time. And finally, when it happened, my wife told me that, you know, she wanted to quit her job and stay at home. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Bay Area of California, but things are quite expensive over here. <laughs> like, no joke, like a yeah. shack will cost you like $3 million. Right. And so you pretty much need two incomes mm -hmm. in order to get in a house in a good school district. And at the time, my wife was making six figures uh, working for a Fortune 500 company. So I was really happy that we finally were able to get pregnant, but I was also freaking out about our finances. And so what ended up happening, and there's, there's more to this story, but we, we ended up starting an e-commerce store selling handkerchiefs. <laughs> and the reason why we got on handkerchiefs is kind of a random product, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is because way back when we got married, which was three years earlier, my wife she knew she was going to cry at the wedding just because she'd be just so happy to spend the rest of her <laughs> life with me. Of course. And we couldn't find them anywhere. And she didn't, we spent all this money on photography and she didn't want to be in the photos using like a, a ratty tissue to dry her tears. Looked all over the place for them. Couldn't find them anywhere in the US, believe it or not. And we found this factory in China to make them for us. The minimum order was huge. So we ordered a couple hundred of these. Wow. We ended up using like six for the bridal party. And uh, when we were done with the wedding, we sold them on eBay and they sold like hotcakes. And that's so later on, you know, fast forward three years, that's when we kind of decided to get back in touch with that factory and sell them full time. Oh my God. So interesting. I have so many questions to dive into, but at the time before you guys started this and your wife wanted to quit her job, what were you doing? What was your career? I was a director of engineering in charge of microprocessor design. We're in the Silicon Valley, okay, so yeah. <laughs> a lot of people are engineers here. Yeah. Okay, so you were an engineer. Before this e-commerce store, had you ever done anything in business, like as an entrepreneur? Uh, I had never started a business before, but I did study it in undergrad. Oh, okay. So I was in this entrepreneurship program. It was more geared towards Silicon Valley stuff, you know, where you get funding and then you go out and raise a bunch of money and you hire like crazy and you try to grow like crazy. Right. Right. So it was not like what I had learned. Okay, so you are in this position where you guys need to replace your income and you want to start a business and you obviously saw this need with linens. But I mean, how did you know even how to get started? Like setting up an e-commerce store, like did you know anything about that stuff? No, I did not. Actually, there's more of the backstory. That we didn't just say, hey, let's just start an e-commerce store. We had first thought about opening a Kumon's. I don't know if you know what that is. Basically a test prep place. We also thought about doing a meal prep place. We thought about opening a pro milk tea place. So there was a bunch of ideas right. that we ran through before we jumped into e-commerce. The reason why we actually ended up thinking about e-commerce and starting a website and all that stuff is one of my buddies, he just, uh, and he's never launched a website or a store before. And this was way back in the day before like all these services there are now. He shows me this website that he threw up selling photos. He was doing sports photography at the time. And I was like, wow, how did you throw that up like in a week? And he showed me and he's like, you know, all the software is practically written for you. All you got to do is install it. And if you know a little bit, or if you feel confident around a computer, you can figure out how to make it look like how you want. And so that's basically how we got the confidence to get started. Oh, that's so cool. And I love that example because I think a lot of people, myself included, when I quit my job as a lawyer, you're sort of scrambling to figure out what you want to do. And, and there's tons of different ideas. I was the same thing. Like, should I become a franchisee? Should I open up my own business? And so I do think it's really relatable what you were saying. Like, you know, should you open up a Kumon or should you be doing e-commerce sites? So it's interesting that I think a lot of times people think it's just them, but I do see this a lot where it's like you don't really know where you should be fitting in. And clearly for you, it worked out, but that's wonderful. So you start getting this idea to do this online store and he kind of showed you how to do a website. But I know at the time, like 2007, I mean, this is all before like Amazon fulfillment centers yep. and everyone yeah. selling online. So like how logistically, like all, I mean, there's so many components to this, like getting the linens and shipping the linens and putting up a website and all of this stuff. I mean, what was that learning curve like? Yeah. So there's there several learning curves. Right. So the website was actually, ironically, probably one of the easier parts. I'm not a web designer by any means, but I could figure it out. The whole importing from China was a little bit <laughs> intimidating. Right. Um, we had done it before for the wedding, but that was like a small order, right? It was coming over by air and the logistically, there wasn't that big of a deal. But when you start importing containers over by, by boat, it gets a little hairier. 
the way we just got around that, I think the very first time is we just had our vendor take care of everything for us. I'm sure we were paying a lot more money than we should have, but initially we just let them take care of everything. Yeah. It was just the easiest path. Was it a significant amount of capital? I'm just wondering, like, did you have any thoughts when you're doing this of like, what are we doing? Like, what if this doesn't work out? Actually, no. Compared to like opening a meal prep place or a right. promo tea place or a Kumans, oh, so much less capital. Actually, we started really with only 600 bucks. Oh, wow. And the reason why is because you can make smaller orders. It just costs you more. Right? Oh, right, right, right. And you can work your way up to more profits. Right. So back then also, there wasn't that much competition. So our markup was incredible. And the fact that there weren't that many handkerchief vendors at all in the US, and still there aren't that many. Right. We were marking things up like 8 to 10x. Wow. And you knew that there, I know you said that you sold yours, so you know there's some people buying it. But like, obviously, in addition to all the logistics, like comes the marketing portion. And like, did you just know that you could get it out? Like you could have people find you? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, the fact that it only cost us 600 bucks to get started you know, we felt zero risk, right. basically. The risk was mainly our time. Like, if we were putting all of our heart into this and it didn't go anywhere, we weren't going to lose any money. Yeah. But we probably would have lost some pride, I guess. I don't <laughs> know. Initially, I had no idea what I was doing. And my master plan in the beginning was to go on the wedding forums and then talk about our products and then get people that way. Because at the time, yeah. there was still like the knot and right. there was uh, some wedding forums and that sort right. of thing. So I actually went on posed as a woman. Her name was Christina Lang. And I got banned oh. from a bunch of forums until oh. I got my stick down. That's so funny. So what I would do is I would go on there and I would just be very helpful. Like if someone asked about wedding dresses, I would point them to resources there. And I did this for about a month. And then after that, you know, people knew me and that sort of thing. I got and I said, hey, does anyone know where I could get some handkerchiefs I want for my wedding? And then, you know, no one would answer or someone might answer like David's Brattle or whatever. And then I would say, oh, okay, guess what? I just found this place. Oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> and then I would steer people over that way. And did you get people like that? I did. Wow. I did get people that way. It was wow. hard work though. Yeah. And yeah. it's not like you could just pitch it every single time. Yeah. So what I would do is every day I would just make sure that thread was at the top of the forum by posting some sort of comment on it so people would see it. It's so interesting. There's so many things that I love about this story and I think come up a lot on this podcast. You know, I think now more than ever, I mean, it might be more saturated, but now it's just so much easier to start something online. And so I think there is more of like a low risk option if you want to start a business, whereas back in the day, like brick and mortar is so expensive. So it really is open to so many more people. And I love that you kind of had that outlook with this. But and you just said like one thing when you were saying, you know, might have hurt our pride. That was my next question is, you know, at the time you're still an engineer and I'm sure your family, like nobody knows what e-commerce, like you guys are selling linens, what? You know, like did you start getting people kind of questioning like, what are you guys doing? What is your wife doing? You know, did you deal with any of that? Yeah, I mean, so I went to Stanford and all my friends are like in professional careers, right? Doctor, right. lawyer, engineer. And they were like, oh, okay, how's your little <laughs> linen store going? You know, yeah. they meant well, but, you know, I could sense a little bit of yeah. condescending behavior, I guess. It was like that in the beginning where we got those questions. But, you know, as soon as we started making money, what was funny about that is they started all asking me like, hey, I want to quit my job. <laughs> what can I sell online? Can you show me what you did? So it's interesting how that works out. And you guys, I mean, did fairly well, really quickly on. Like you guys, you were saying made 100K in the first year. Yeah, we basically replaced my wife's salary. There was a bunch of other things that were kind of lucky that happened. So my brother-in-law was working at Google. And at that time, AdWords was just getting started. And he was like, hey, why don't you give this a try? Oh. You see if you can just drive some traffic to your site. And I was like, okay, I'll sign up and I'll see what happens. It turned out to be a gold mine right. there as well. Back in the day when AdWords was not nearly as competitive as today. Mm -hmm. So we got in early and that traffic was converting at like 8 to 10x return on ad spend. Oh my it's God. crazy. Yeah, that's incredible. And you guys also, I read somewhere that you guys like personalized these, you embroidered these. And I think I read somewhere that you were personally yes. doing the embroidery. Yeah, I was doing it for, I think the first year pretty much. Do you know how to sew and do embroidery? I didn't at the time, but I, you know, you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> That's amazing. I would come home from work at around six and then we'd have dinner and then I'd sew for like two hours and then I'd go to bed. 
Oh my God, that's incredible. And I mean, I guess that's my next question because a lot of people really would love this type of route. I think the idea of having a side hustle, you know, before you leave your job, an appealing one, especially to people that are tend to be risk averse. I want to ask like, you know, how did you make this work? But I also want to like clue in people that you ended up starting multiple six figure, seven figure businesses while you were still working. So what did that look like? What was your days like? With the e-commerce store, thank God we had two people. And what ended up happening was I ended up just handling all the marketing for the e-commerce store and my wife handled the logistics. And as soon as we were able to actually hire someone to do the sewing, thank God, (laughs) I had enough people asking me about the whole process of how we got started that I just decided to keep an online journal. And that's how my wife quitterjob.com was born. What was funny about that was I got the idea of eventually turning that into a business because of this personal development blogger. His name is Steve Pavlina. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I have. But he published this post. It's called How to Make Your First Love Dollar. And at the time, he was doing like $4,000 a day off of AdSense alone. And I was like, wow, I can just write something and then put ads on it and people will pay me. And so I started just documenting the entire journey. And what was funny about that was my friends who were kept asking me how we got started in the store, they didn't read it at all. And instead, I got a bunch of random strangers reading it. And then mm-hmm. that's how I developed a following, just kind of by accident. And how did that turn into you growing, not only like monetizing and making money off the blog, but then you also started like training program where you were selling like these courses where you're training people on how to set up e-commerce sites, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that just arrived out of the readers just asking a lot of questions and they demanded a course actually. Mm. And I actually didn't want to do it because (laughs) I was already swamped with work and then helping with the e-commerce store. And so I was like, all right, fine. So I ended up launching a course without any material in it. Mm. I just said, hey, if you guys are willing to pay me this amount of money, I will create content on a weekly basis and I'll just keep it up and you can get lifetime access. This was back in 2011. And I'm still running it today and I still get on and I put out a new piece of content every single week, answer questions and that sort of thing. And I've just been raising the price every year. Oh my God, that's incredible. That's how that got started. Okay, so just going back. So 2011 is when you start this. You started the e-commerce store in 2007. At what point, and like the blog is making money, the training program is making money and you're making you know multiple six figures, if not seven figures, but how long did you keep your job until? Like when did you finally leave? Yeah, I didn't quit until 2016. Both businesses were seven-figure businesses. Here's the thing about my job. I actually really like it. Uh. It's what I've done all my life. I knew all my life pretty much that I wanted to become an electrical engineer. And I was, here's the appeal. I was working with people that were all from like MIT, Stanford, Princeton, Yale. They all had their PhDs. They were all much smarter than I was. And it was just nice to work in that environment around really intelligent people. And so I actually would still, believe it or not, be working there today. I had a sweet setup towards the end where I was working basically two days a week over there, which was the perfect balance right. of work plus you know, having coworkers and that sort of thing and doing my own thing. Unfortunately, it's not really sustainable to work that little when you're an engineer on a project. It's so unique. I mean, I've never heard, honestly, I feel like most people's story is when they do end up making a, you know enough money to replace, end up leaving. So... I think it's awesome that if you liked it, you were able to do it. But how did you balance like doing these multiple seven figure businesses, having that job, and then you have two kids and you have a wife? And I mean, were you working unbelievable hours? That's the misconception that a lot of people have. I think when it comes to businesses like blogging, e-commerce is a little bit more involved. But when it comes to blogging, like I was just putting out one post a week. That's it. At the time, I think I already had the podcast too. So I was doing one podcast a week. And the podcast actually helped more than it was work because I was meeting new people. I don't know if that's the reason why you do yours, but that's definitely the main reason why I do mine. Yeah, same. And running the course, the office hours were basically, I'd give one office hours a week. So all told at the time, it was about 10 to 15 hours, I would Mm. say a week. There's, I think, a lot of learning lessons from that. A lot of people want to start. And I think there is the excuse of like, I don't have enough time because it's a matter of like shifting priorities and being able to make it. But one thing that I like that you're honest about on your blog too, is that these types of avenues, while there's like a lower cost, like barrier to entry, everyone can set up a blog or start a podcast. They do take a while. So you were talking about your blog, like you were consistently putting out content for 
how long before you actually started kind of growing this? It's about three years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like a long tail game if it's something that you're interested in. I think it just depends. Like the e-commerce store, since you're actually selling something, you can make money a lot faster. But with blogging and some of the more avenues with less barriers to entry, you really just have to be consistent about it and slog through it, really. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So obviously, selling like e-commerce is a lot easier now. There's so much more infrastructure. There's so many tools. But obviously, it's a lot more saturated. So what does that landscape look like for now? Like if somebody wants to get involved, is there still just like a ton of space or is it hard to get breakthrough now? I mean, there's always space in my opinion. Like. Mm -hmm. You could start a blog today, a podcast today. A lot of people might say that's saturated, but as long as you have some sort of angle and a good value proposition, you can make anything work, right? I'm sure people like 100 years ago were saying, oh, everything in business is so saturated. <laughs> right. You know, I think that's a cop out. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. It's funny because with each thing too, like it creates different needs. Like now when there are so many bloggers and there's so many podcasters, there's now like these wholesale new industries of like people doing, managing social media marketing, or there's so many other things that can help industries. And I think if you want to get involved in a business, it's just a matter of like seeing where the need is now. Yeah. So then you've gone on from this and it's not like you've stopped there because now you put on a live conference every year for e-commerce and you also started a giveaway site. Is there a certain point where you're like, I'm taking on too much? So if it was by myself, then yes, that would be the case. I think for the event, I actually did not want to do it at all in the beginning, but people were asking for it like, hey, let's have a meetup why don't you just throw something together and we'll all go and so we can meet each other? And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that sounds like a ton of work. And then mm -hmm. I met my partner, Tony Anderson. She had run events for many years and we had this pact. I was like, okay, I can sell the tickets. I can get the speakers and I can get sponsors, but I just want to show up mm -hmm. and have the event ready to go. And so that's kind of been our partnership agreement. Like I handle all the business things and she handles all the logistics of the actual event and it's worked out really well. That's awesome. And do you feel like, I know a lot of times people, either the cost or some people don't feel as outgoing and so they don't go to a lot of live events. And I know for me, live events have really like changed the trajectory of what I'm doing and it just speeds up the amount that I learned. So I wonder what your experience of like going to conferences is. Yeah. Okay. So I am what is called extroverted introvert. <laughs> like if it's a bunch of random people, then I feel a little bit shy. And so like if you're just starting out with events, it's actually very important because the way I've grown my blog especially is by making new friends and helping each other either by promotion or linking or, or whatnot. It's been invaluable. So I would say like if you're going to a conference or if you're a bit shy about going to a conference for the first time, I would tend to go to a smaller event. The reason why we created like my event, for example, I purposely keep it small. Mm. We sell out usually many months before the event and I keep it small and it's focused on networking. So the way we do it, and there's other conferences out there like this, but we make sure that everyone eats together. Mm. We all drink together and we really promote like putting groups together. So you don't feel uncomfortable because that's the type of event that I would want to go right. to. Right, right. So yeah, if you're just starting out with events, I would suggest not going to like this gigantic like 5,000 person event. That makes total sense. So the store right now, is that, do you still work on that or is that run more by your wife and the team? Yeah, so I still work on it, of course. I teach a class on the subject, so I have to stay <laughs> right. up to date on all the trends. And so I kind of treat the store as a laboratory. Whenever there's a new tool, I'll just install it. And then I'll kind of write about the results or my experiences with it. And my wife is doing, I guess, the operations. Mm -hmm. And we have employees in a warehouse. And she's much better at that stuff mm -hmm. than I am. I'm much better at the marketing and getting the business part and the technical stuff. Well, it's such a cool story. Do you have any like final advice maybe for somebody that is stuck in a job that they don't like and they just don't really know where to start. I mean, the online world can kind of seem daunting because it's, again, like, where do you go? I mean, do you have anything that helped you or your wife kind of figure out what each of your next steps should be? Yeah, you know, this whole thing about not liking your job, I think people grossly underestimate how much time that they waste mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we talked about me not spending that much time on my businesses, but for the e-commerce store, it was actually a tremendous amount of time in the very beginning, because there's a lot of things we had to figure out. And so we basically cut out TV, 
cut out a bunch of our other activities at night. And we basically focused on that. And we focused our weekends as well, working on the business. You just kind of have to commit to it. Right. And whenever someone tells me that they don't have that much time, I tend not to believe them <laughs> because you can always find some time to do it. What you got to tell yourself mentally is that I'm going to work on this consistently. Well, I tell myself forever, but realistically, you know, at least three to five years to give yourself a chance mm. to get something going. And so as long as you put something in your routine that you're working on a regular basis, eventually something good will happen. That is such great advice. I mean, you know, so many of us want something to happen instantly or within a year. And a lot of times that's just not the reality. You know, the time's going to pass anyways. And so putting that time in, and I agree with you. It's funny. Like, I feel like I used to get defensive about that. And I think there's like this glorification of being busy in our culture. Be like, oh, I'm so busy and I have kids. And then when I started cutting things out, you know, now there's like, have you seen on like the cell phones where it gives you the report of like how much screen time you're using? And then oh, you're like, yeah, yeah. oh no, I do waste a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so social media is like the biggest time suck. Yeah, exactly. So I love that. Thank you so much for joining us, Steve. I think this has been incredibly valuable, and I know people are going to learn a lot from it. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. How cool is Steve's story? It is so inspiring, and I'm so honored that he chose to share it with us. Here are my three takeaways. One, I hate to break it to you, but you have enough time. It's all about priorities. I mean, Steve showed us that he has built multiple six- and seven-figure businesses while having a full-time job. And I know it sounds crazy, and we love, you know, talking about how busy we are. I get it. We have kids. We have families. We have jobs. We have demanding schedules. But if you're really real about it, we waste a lot of time on whether it be binge-watching shows or social media or whatever else it is. And if you really want to build something on the side, you will make the time for it. Two, you don't have to have the whole thing figured out. You just have to take one step. I love his story because it wasn't that he started out knowing he was going to build, you know, a live conference and a blog and a podcast and an online store. He started with an online store and each thing led to a need that he then fulfilled. Like people wanted to know how he was doing this online store. So he started this course, you know, so you just kind of take that first step and keep moving along and things will kind of unfold. And three, think about the long game. So often we want to find something and, you know, we want to have that quote unquote, like success, full business, whatever that looks like in six months. Like it doesn't work that way. He talked about how it's three to five years for like a blog, but it ultimately will pay off if you stick with it. It's just that we tend to want things very quickly. So think about the long game. And with that... I hope you guys like this episode. Let me know what you think and I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for listening. I can't tell you how much it means to me. If you liked the podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. It'll help other people find the show. If you want to connect or reach out, follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Lessons from a Quitter and on Twitter at Quitter Podcast. I would love to hear from you guys and I'll see you on the next episode.